indication that there's a problem of free speech on campus is given by uh, polls of students, uh, which show that uh, considerable majority, sometimes close to three quarters, uh, believe that uh, hateful ideas uh, have no place on campus, racist, uh, sexist, xenophobic, and so on. And I think that is a problem. Uh, it's a problem because though you, the motives are understandable, uh, admirable in many ways, and can be accommodated appropriately, I think. Uh, nevertheless, the principle is mistaken. We, I'm sure, will have ample discussion of that. And it's also uh, a tactical error uh, for quite a number of reasons. One of them you've just seen. If you look at the history of such concepts, uh, which is rich and ugly, uh, they ha it, the prin such principles have almost invariably been directed against vulnerable groups, uh, groups that uh, deviate from uh, what George Orwell once called the pervasive orthodoxy uh, and have been efforts to sustain a power, authority, and domination. Now that goes right till the present, in fact, and we can anticipate that if such principles are established and expect, uh, uh, in a firm fashion, uh, that'll continue to be the way they're used. And there's another reason why it's tactically mistaken. Uh, if you have a festering sore, uh, the cure is not to irritate it, uh, but to find out what its roots, are, where it comes from, and to deal with those. Uh, racist and other such speech is a festering sore. By silencing it, you simply amplify its appeal and even lend it a veneer of respectability, as in fact we've seen very clearly in the last a couple, of, a couple of years. Uh, and what has to be done, plainly, is to confront it and to ask where it comes from and to try to deal with the roots of such ideas. That's the way to extirpate the uh, ugliness and uh, uh, evil that uh, lies behind such uh, phenomena. And as we think about this, I suggest reflecting a little on something that's really not the topic tonight, but nevertheless is worth keeping in the back of your mind. Uh, when we ask about the state of free speech on campus today, uh, we should be asking ourselves in comparison to what? Well, the natural comparison is to uh, the period when student activism in the modern period really began to take off uh, some of the pictures that you saw, uh, the 1960s. So what was the situation like on campus at that time? Well, uh, one of the major recent books on free speech on campus, uh, actually the uh, book that had the lead review in the New York Times book review last Sunday is called The Coddling of the American Mind. And it uh, discusses the danger of uh, safe spaces, uh, other devices, which are leading, it claims, with some justification, uh, to uh, uh, citizenry, which is unwilling uh, to face uh, alternative ideas and uh, uh, stays within its own cocoon that's destructive of the people, of course, destructive of democracy. I think there's a fair amount of validity of that, and we can ask what it was like in the 1960s. Well, when the student movements began to develop, what they were opposing was safe spaces, namely the university system and the intellectual culture, which was a safe space for the prevailing orthodoxy uh, with remarkable effectiveness, as Orwell wrote, speaking of England. That's what the university and the culture was like. Uh, and minds were indeed coddled. They were protected from uh, what were regarded as dangerous ideas. Actually, you saw an example of that in the, uh, the comments about Russell. It happened to be a little bit earlier, but that was very much the case 
in the uh, academic environment and in fact the intellectual culture generally in the 1950s and early 60s. And that's why when you look at the, what the student movement was doing, it was not only uh, engaged in uh, important tasks of uh, trying to gain the right of free speech on campus, but uh, in discipline after discipline, students were creating alternatives. Uh, the major issue in the 60s, one of the major issues was the Vietnam War. Uh, the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars, initiated by students, it's flourished since, still alive, was a critique of the prevailing orthodoxy in uh, uh, political science and Asian studies department, which was extremely rigid. Uh, same happened in economics and political science and uh, uh, history and so on. The Union of Concerned Sciences, scientists was critiquing the unwillingness of the scientific community to confront seriously uh, the effects of the use of the technology and scientific ideas that they were developing. This was pre prevalent throughout. And if you look back at the orthodoxy of the 60s, you can understand why. Uh, we may have forgotten, but it's worth remembering. So for example, in the 1960s, uh, the leading uh, study of American diplomatic history by a distinguished liberal scholar uh, blandly described the task of the colonists once they had attained independence. Uh, their task, he said, was uh, to turn to the job of felling trees and Indians and expanding to the national borders. That's pervasive orthodoxy, felling trees and Indians and expanding to the national borders. Not a hint of protest. Actually, if you look up the phrase on Google, uh, you'll find the nature of the protest. A couple of dozen quotes from things of mine and nothing else, uh, because no one saw anything wrong with it. Uh, today, I think it would be inconceivable that you could have a statement like that almost anywhere, but certainly not in the uh, leading, most prestigious uh, uh, history of American diplomacy. Uh, and it continues. Uh, the leading anthropologists in the country were telling us that uh, the uh, in Indian population was a group of scattered uh, savages uh, dedicated to vicious warfare, or no culture, or nothing. Uh, the, uh, uh, it, it, in uh, the Cold War, which was, of course, uh, raging at the time, uh, the sole uh, uh, idea that could be expressed was what's called the orthodox position. Uh, the United States' is absolute sublimity, our enemy is ultimate evil, uh, nothing further to discuss. Uh, uh, if you think about, uh, and, and this conveyed, it, it, not only coddled the minds of students, but coddled the general population. So you look at attitudes at the time, uh, about 5% of the population thought that interracial marriages were tolerable. 50 years later, it's about 90%. And that's a large reason for that is the impact of student activism. Uh, you have to recall that in the 1960s, the United States still had anti-miscegenation laws, the laws so severe that when the Nazis in the 1930s were looking for models, these were the only ones they could find, but they were too harsh. So the Nazis wouldn't accept them because we, U.S. had the one drop of blood principle. That was too much for the Nazis. Uh, same on issue after issue. I, it's something that one should definitely bear in mind. So yes, the academic culture, the intellectual culture were safe spaces. They were coddling the American mind and the student activism has played an enormous role uh, in the vanguard of uh, demolishing much of this. There's plenty to be done still. We can say not this extreme, but similar things today. And that should be recognized. In fact, it's happened right here in Tucson as Many of you know better than I do. Uh, there was an effort by the legislature to uh, 
uh, kill a very effective uh, Mexican-American studies program in the schools. Uh, it was confronted by students, high school students, who demonstrated, protested uh, effectively. Uh, they didn't manage to ban the law, but they did create a, help create a mentality which led the federal judge to impose an injunction so that it can't be applied. Uh, these are very important things to keep in mind, I think, in the background when we talk about the problems of, campus, of free speech on campus today, which are very significant ones.